Well, good morning. It is a real privilege to be invited to share in your conference and to bring teaching from the Word of God. Well, let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and eternal and sovereign God, we marvel at thy rich grace and salvation provided for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We trace back that great plan to eternity past, that covenant made between Father and Son and Holy Spirit, whereby our redemption was secured. We thank thee for our Saviour, who left the courts of glory and came to this world, and at Calvary's cross, through his atoning work, purchased the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, that we might be regenerated, that our dead hearts might be touched with new life, that our minds may be enlightened by thy truth with understanding and with conviction. We praise and bless thee that our salvation is all of grace and that its fullness is yet to be experienced when we come to glory in that glorious day the marriage supper of the Lamb, that new heaven and earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, which is still our hope. Bless us now as we consider the teaching of thy word together. Grant that each and every one that attends this conference may be well grounded in the truth and equipped to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ in the days ahead. We ask these things in his name. Amen. When our subject this morning is Armenian versus Reformed views of regeneration. Regeneration is sometimes viewed as referring to the whole process of conversion, but importantly also refers to the inception of spiritual life in the heart as a result of which repentance faith and a change of life follow. And it is this latter aspect of regeneration especially that I'd like us to consider this morning. The reformed view is that this inception of spiritual life is an act of God alone by his spirit. And there is a great contrast between the Arminian and the reformed views of this part of regeneration. And it's a fundamental issue because our view of how and who imparts that life to the soul shapes our methodology when it comes to evangelism. If we believe that man has an ability in and of himself uh, to leave his past life of sin, to decide for Christ, as people say, then we may see gospel work as merely aimed at persuading that man to make a choice of his own power and volition. And as a result, many are tempted to employ all sorts of means, resorting to anything that will impart a response. But so often those responses are merely emotional responses. They will say the lighting has got to be right. The music has got to be conducive. People have got to be put into a right frame of mind, a right disposition. Auditoriums must be impressive. And so the list goes on. If our view of regeneration is that it is of God alone, then our focus, is, our focus is upon him and our dependence upon him entirely to effect conversion, to open the heart as Lydia's was opened, that souls may attend to gospel things and gospel precepts. It will shape our manner and our language in gospel preaching. We do believe in persuasive preaching. And I will touch on that a little bit later on this morning. 
but we never impart the idea to our hearers that they can save themselves by deciding for Christ. Rather, we urge the lost to turn to Christ, to call upon him in order that he may save them. Because they must understand that conversion is from beginning to end the work of God. Even faith is the gift of God. He must give repentance unto life. Well, the Arminian view, with some variations, is helpfully summarized by Louis Burkhoff in his Systematic Theology. He says this, The Arminian believes regeneration is not exclusively the work of God, nor exclusively the work of man. Rather, it is the result of a person's choice to cooperate with the divine influences exerted on them by means of the truth. The Arminian view does not assume that there is a preceding work of God upon the heart by which a person is inclined to repentance and faith. A slightly different view, but still an Arminian view, is known as the Wesleyan Arminian view. It's slightly different in that they do stress that regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit, albeit in cooperation with the human will. And while they assume a prior work of the Holy Spirit to enlighten and to convict, they also believe that man can resist this work and that as long as he does resist, he remains in his unregenerate condition. So that's in a nutshell the Arminian view. And there may be many slightly different uh, views within that fold, but that's a helpful summary, I believe. The Reformed view is such a contrast. And I'd like to begin as we focus upon this contrast by quoting from the Westminster Confession of Faith under chapter 10, the effectual call. Now, some regard regeneration and effectual calling as not identical, but this definition of the effectual call certainly has regeneration, at least the inception of life in the heart as uppermost, in mind when it speaks of God's work in the lost soul. Let us hear what our forebears wrote when they compiled this confession. All those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills, and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether passive therein. Until being quickened and renewed by the, the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. So in this section, when it refers to the initiating of spiritual life, it precedes man's response. And our forebears made that clear, that it was their understanding. So as we think about the reformed view, of regeneration. 
and particularly that view which is expressed in that definition of the effectual call, which certainly begins with what I have de de described as regeneration, then what can we draw from this definition? And how is it rooted in Scripture? Firstly, we have to acknowledge that there is a general or outward call of God to all men through the gospel. But at the same time, we speak of an inward or effectual call of God by his Holy Spirit. And this confession makes clear that it is only those who are the elect of God, who are given to Christ, for whom Christ died at Calvary and purchased for them the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that inward call of God is known. The outward call is made through the preaching of the gospel to all who hear it. But the inward call, which we can call the effectual call, and by effectual here, we mean that it is effective, it produces that intended change within the heart that is only heard and only experienced by God's elect. And it is the work of God to awaken them, to regenerate them, to impart life to their soul. And it is his work alone. We read this in John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of or from the Father cometh unto me. It is as God instructs our heart through his Spirit that we will come unto him in repentance and faith, seeking a new heart, new life, and real salvation. Secondly, reform, the reformed teaching of regeneration is that regeneration does not depend on the active cooperation of the sinner. And that is an important distinction between the Arminian view and the reformed or Calvinistic view. Man is entirely passive as God imparts life to the soul. And it is only after that life is imparted that conviction is experienced an awakening to spiritual realities takes place. And it is from that point that the, that the awakened sinner begins to respond, drawn to Christ by the power of God, moved by conviction to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the mighty power of God alone. How can we demonstrate that this is the true biblical view? Well, firstly, because in Scripture, regeneration is pictured as a resurrection. Think about it. Did Lazarus have any hand when he was hand in his own resurrection when he was raised by Christ? from the dead? Of course not. It's preposterous so to think or speak. And yet the Apostle Paul says, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the word quickened there, it means to make alive. You has he made alive. The sinner does not cooperate in regeneration because regeneration is the imparting of life. It is a being raised from the dead. We read in John chapter 6 verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Secondly, 
Regeneration is described in Scripture as a new creation. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Ephesians 2, verse 12. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 states this. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And so, therefore, there needs to be a new heart imparted. The old carnal heart can never receive the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, we read, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Until we receive a new heart by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, we are at enmity with God. We are not subject to the law of God. We do not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto us. Neither can we know them, grasp them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so it is foolish to suggest that man cooperates in his own regeneration and conversion. Of course not. This work is the work of God alone. King David said, Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Ezekiel 11 verse 19 reads, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And will take away, take the stony heart of flesh, heart out of their flesh, and will give them an heart of flesh. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. It is a new creation. The work of God in regeneration is a work that God does. And it's only once that work of God has taken place in the heart and we are given a new heart, a tender heart, a heart that is enabled to respond to the call of the gospel and to relate to spiritual things, it's only then when that stage of conversion has been reached, that we can in any way respond to the call of the gospel. The Apostle Paul says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Creation is the work of the Creator. And the imparting of spiritual life is to bring about a new creation within. If any man be in Christ Jesus, says the Apostle, he is a new creature, a new creation. This is God's work and it's pictured by that language. Thirdly, regeneration is described in Scripture especially in the Gospel of John, as a new birth. And if it is a birth, then let each of us ask this question. What hand did we have in our birth? None whatsoever. What hand did we have in our conception when life first was given to us in the womb? It was something in which we were entirely passive. And yet the Lord, by his Spirit, guided the apostles and spoke by Christ to use this language to describe the regenerating of our souls. It is a new birth experience. John chapter 1, from verse 12, we read this. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, 
which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So verse 13 here, which I've just quoted, explains why verse 12 happened. Verse 12 said, as many as received him, to those that believe on his name. Why do we receive Christ? Why are we brought to believe in him as the Son of God, the all-sufficient and only Savior? Why do we come in faith, yield our lives to him, and acknowledge him as our sufficiency? It is because we are born of God, says the very following verse. It is the effect described first, but the cause that explains the effect in, verse, in the verse that follows. Then again in John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus answered Nicodemus and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so again here, we see cause and effect. First, says the Lord, a man must be born again. Then he can see, perceive the kingdom of God and spiritual things. He must be born of the Spirit, and then he can enter into the kingdom of God. Regeneration, new birth, is the cause. Faith and the activities of faith, seeing and entering, are the effect of regeneration. Again, we read in 1 John, the first letter of John, chapter 5. And verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. And verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him him not. So we have faith, love, obedience and holiness here all described as being the fruits, the effects of being begotten of God. And this word begot, it's the word from which in English we get regeneration. It is to have life imparted to us. It is to be quickened. It is to be born again. And the fruits of that new birth are that faithful, believing response to the gospel. That tender heart that desires holiness. That prayerfully calls upon the Lord and said, grant to me the power and the strength that I may keep myself from sin. Work within my soul day by day that I may not fall. Thirdly, Regeneration, the reformed view, is that regeneration is irresistible. The Apostle Paul says, Philippians 1, verse 6, He which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The inward call, the effectual call of which Regeneration, as I have defined it, is such an important aspect, is different to the outward call of the gospel. The outward call is heard by many who never are moved to hear the inward call and to grasp the reality and the authority of the gospel, the preciousness of Christ, the certainty of the day of judgment, the ugliness of sin, the glories of that heavenly world, the privileges of being a child of God, 
of experiencing God's guiding grace. All of these things we, we preach through the outward call of the gospel. But it's not until the Spirit of God touches our hearts and brings us to life, that aspect of the call that we call the inward call, that there is an irresistible response. We do believe, as Reformed people, in what is known as common grace. And by common grace we mean, or we include, those general workings of the Spirit of God in mankind in general. For example, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, the Lord says to Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Possibly there he was referring to the preaching of Noah. And God's spirit strove, says the scripture, with man in those days. The gospel was preached. Noah sounded that note of warning. But it was a common grace experience. Many who heard dismissed the notion that God would flood the earth with water. Again in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, Stephen, preaching to uh, those Jewish rulers, said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. He's not referring there to the effectual call, but rather he is referring to the outward call and the common grace of God that presses the truth upon their hearts, but not in a saving way. That can be resisted. But when it comes to that sovereign and gracious work of God within the soul, the scripture makes it clear it is an irresistible work. This regeneration is effectual, said our forebears. It always, if it always leads to the intended change. My people shall be willing in the day of my power. Psalm 110 and verse 3. John 6 verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. It is a work that is irresistible. Fourthly, regeneration is instantaneous. Inasmuch as it is described in scripture as a quickening. We cannot be, we are either dead or alive. And it's true to say that the elect of God are made alive. You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. It is by the Spirit of God alone working directly upon the heart that we are brought from death unto life. As a result of that work of the imparting of life upon the soul, we then respond to the word of truth. As we, as it is, as we read it or as it is preached in our hearing. But the initial inception of life by which we are subsequently enabled to respond to the word of God, that initial regeneration is by God alone. It is instantaneous and it precedes any response of the lost soul to the gospel, either in repentance or faith or being moved to seek or yield to Christ or receive his salvation. It comes before all of those things. Fifthly, regeneration then is an act of sovereign grace on the part of God. If we could just summarize those first four aspects of regeneration that we've 
looked at here that define the Reformed view as opposed to the Arminian view, we can say, firstly, it is an inward call of the Spirit of God within the heart. Secondly, it does not depend upon the active cooperation of the sinner, but rather the exercise of the mighty power of God alone. Thirdly, it is irresistible. Fourthly, it is instantaneous and precedes any response from the sinner. Therefore, it has to be an act of sovereign grace on the part of God. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, says the Lord, quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans. And in that respect, it is not on account of foreseen good in the person who is the recipient of this regenerating work of God. It is not because God sees this person and that person as being any more worthy of his grace and his salvation. It is an act of his sovereign good pleasure to touch the heart of his elect people and bring them to himself. We read in Titus chapter 3 and verse 4, After that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Charles Hodge says, since a tree must be made good before the fruit is good, the goodness of the fruit cannot be the reason which determines him who has the power to change the tree from bad to good. Christ's healing miracles were not applied for by the needy or received by them on the grounds that some special goodness existed or resided within them, they came often unworthy. The woman of Tyre came to Christ willingly acknowledging that she was but a dog. She knew that she had no claim upon Christ. There was nothing good in her that commended her to him. It was only his mercy and sovereign grace by which she could obtain the blessing that she sought. Rather, in other words, rather than uh, embracing the notion that God saves some because of foreseen good in them, rather the reformed view is that regeneration of the elect has been secured by the covenant of redemption. Why does God save this person? Why does he save me and not that person and you and not some other individual? It is because of the covenant of redemption. That covenant drawn up in eternity past in which the father gave unto his son a people. Read John chapter 17 and see there Christ understood very clearly that the Father had given a people unto him. And it was those people that he came to die for. He laid down his life for his sheep. He came into this world in order to give his life a ransom for them. It is Christ that purchased the Holy Spirit on Calvary's cross for his Elect people whom the Father had given to him. And we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God unto sanctification of the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God unto sanctification of the Spirit. Peter has in mind there at the very least regeneration but much more of course 
He's including regeneration. Why are we regenerated? Because their God has a covenant purpose of grace towards us. Christ purchased that gift of the Holy Spirit by which we would receive at the outset of our Christian experience new life. And that Spirit would be given to us in greater measure as our life proceeds. His sanctifying influences, his enlightening influences, grace to help in time of need, all these things flow from the Spirit of God, but regeneration is the first and foremost of all those, those spiritual works that are done in us. And they, that work precedes all our responses to the gospel. The Apostle Paul says this, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, Who hath saved us? And called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The Reformed view is that regeneration, when referring to the initial conception of new life in the soul, is holy a work of God's sovereign power and it precedes all the activity of faith and repentance, of love and obedience. Nevertheless, and before we conclude, we must acknowledge this fact to understand that the reformed view of regeneration does not lead to a discouraging of true evangelistic preaching. Nevertheless, we believe that the conversion of a sinner is more than simply a quickening of the heart. Of course not. Conversion involves that imparting of life to the soul, but that is followed by a conviction of sin, and awakening unto spiritual things, repentance, faith, an experience of justification and conscious new birth, assurance of forgiveness. We can include all of those things as one of the other speakers has shown in what we call the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. And this is a process of various lengths. In some, all of these stages of conversion from initial regeneration through to that conscious assurance of forgiveness, they happen very quickly. But in others, it's quite protracted. Pardon in the scripture is promised on condition of repentance. Read Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 and 8. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy. To our God he will abundantly pardon. It speaks of a process. The wicked first must be regenerated, awakened. That carnal mind that is at enmity with God must be changed. But with that new heart will come repentance. Repentance must be exercised before that awareness of the forgiving love of God can be experienced. Then the awakened soul is enabled to respond to the outward call of the gospel. Once the Lord has opened the heart as Lydia's was opened. So what do we mean by the outward call of the gospel? You see, as preachers, we are called to preach the gospel, not because we believe that man has the ability in and of himself to respond, or that we have the power by our persuasion and convincing of the mind uh, to impart life to a soul that is previously dead. But we preach the outward call of the gospel 
because we believe that those whom the Lord does touch, whose hearts he does open, will be enabled subsequently to respond. So in the preaching of the gospel, we can speak of a declaration of the plan of salvation. We explain uh, the whole and glorious work of Christ. We can speak of the promise of God to save all that assent to that gospel message of salvation by Christ alone. We can speak in the preaching of the gospel of the command of God or the exhortation of God, the invitation of God to all to repent of their sin and to accept the mercy offered and apply to Christ for salvation. And fourthly, in gospel preaching, we must set out the reasons, the inducements, if you like, the warnings associated with a, a rejection of the gospel, the blessings associated with a reception of the gospel. We may persuade, as Paul did at Corinth in Acts chapter 18, we reason with souls, but we never give them the impression that all they need to do is sign up for Christ, as it were. We urge them to turn to Christ, to appeal to him, that he should do a mighty work and complete a mighty work within the soul. We read this in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 13. We are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Notice the order there. Chosen unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, his regenerating work and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. The gospel calls the elect out of the world. But that regenerating work of the Spirit must take place in the heart before we ever can respond to that gospel call. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, this verse has to be taken alongside those other verses that speak of the new birth. In the, apostle, the, the epistle of John and the gospel of John, we read of the, those who are born of the Spirit. But here we are born again by the word of God. Are these in conflict? Can we say on the one hand that the new birth is the work of the Spirit of God, and yet on the other hand, it is as a result of hearing and being moved by the word of God? No, they are complementary. The initial imparting of life is by the Spirit of God. That aspect of new birth is through God alone. But then the Spirit of God moves us to heed the word of God. It is the instrumental means by which that process of conversion the fullness of new birth, if you like, is accomplished. And so we can say it's as we heard and believed the word of God that we came to the fullness of that conversion experience. Hence, as we draw to conclusion, I must say this. Hence, we must preach, firstly, faithfully knowing that God must work if there are, is going to be any fruit to our labours. He must work in quickening. And then he must work through the word that is preached so that it works powerfully and effectually to bring about conviction of sin and a, a love and admiration and a desire after Christ within the heart. 
Secondly, we preach dependently, not resorting to human means and to innovative ideas. We preach plainly. We preach the word of God in its full counsel. We preach Christ. We do not resort to emotional responses. We do not preach impatiently, thinking I must drive home the message and, uh, and effect a, a decision this evening. We believe that if the Lord, by his sovereign grace, determines to save sinners through our ministry, then he will do so in his own time and way. We preach earnestly. We preach knowing that souls, it's a fearful thing for sinners to fall into the hands of an angry God. And so in one sense, there is to be an urgency to our preaching of the gospel, but at the same time, there is a dependence in our preaching, knowing that the Lord must effect a change in the sinner, and he will do that in his own sovereign way and in his own sovereign timescale. Lastly, we preach expectantly. Confident that God is able to convert the most stubborn of individuals. He brought down the walls of Jericho such that the Israelites could enter the city. And he is able, by the power of his spirit in regeneration, to remove all the barriers of pride and prejudice, a love of self, a love of the world. He can remove and disarm the sinner of all his false notions and atheistic ideas and humble the sinner and bring that sinner to recognize the call of God through the gospel and therefore respond in repentance and faith. Well, may the Lord impress upon our hearts, each of us this morning, the conviction that regeneration is the work of God. And it is the work of God alone in imparting life to the soul. And that life must precede every response to the gospel that ensues and follows from it. We cannot embrace, we cannot subscribe to the Arminian view that man is not entirely passive, but he cooperates with the gracious work of God. And that unless he cooperates, he will be lost forever. This is not the teaching of God's word. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we thank thee for thy holy word. We thank thee for that irresistible touch of thy spirit that many of us have experienced. We thank thee that we have been enabled to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive him as our saviour, to yield to him in repentance and love and desire. We acknowledge that unless thou hadst first created within us a new heart, a clean heart, and raised us from death to life, and brought about that new birth within, we should never have turned to the Saviour. We praise and bless thee for thy gracious work. Encourage each of the brothers who preaches week by week to do so faithfully, dependently and expectantly, knowing that the power of God so often is promised to attend the preaching of the gospel of the grace of Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen.